Welcome to the Concrete Podcast. Concrete is a platform for Christians working with young people, helping them to connect, to think, and to amplify. This is episode one from the Masculinity Think Tank. I'm Natalie Collins. I'm Mike Rutt. And I'm James Fawcett. So we're going to talk today about masculinity and Gareth South, Southgate. Yeah. Do we all love him? I love Gareth. <laughs> Mostly because he played for Crystal Palace, but I love Gareth. Yeah. <laughs> so what, what do you love about him? Waistcoat. Waistcoat. I mean. <laughs> No, I think overall it was he represented something that we needed to see around around masculinity and around leadership, I suppose, overall. Yeah. And he's so different to previous people, you know, doing that role. Yeah, I, well, I found it, you know, I've been around sports in my life and it's a completely different way of managing people to what you are used to. So you're seeing people go in there, managers go in there and shout and ball and um, get mad, but... Kind of, it was almost a really pastoral way of managing yeah. that. Uh, there was an openness, there was a care, there was a love, there was a dynamic that was created that's completely different to what we've seen before. Yeah, I love that bit at the end of the when they lost, um, and then he went around to each player and was like, gave him a hug. Obviously, said a little few words, and then and then after that, Dan some fell to their knees and you know upset or t- and tired probably. And um, he was like, no, okay, I'll get up. And there's, so there's like, there's that like pride bit as well. I don't know, it's that strange like mix of being like, grr, manly stand up kind of, and genuine kindness, seeming like kind, I don't know, does that make sense? Yeah, I think for me, like, I'd have no interest in football or sport generally. So it's interesting like having not <laughs> come to, the, like I don't think I've ever watched any England football or football generally ever so obviously did you watch it? I didn't watch it all but watched some of it and actually mainly followed it more from kind of social media pictures and videos of him and so actually I'm not coming to it with a previous understanding of how how football is normally kind of coached and that kind of stuff but but just seeing as somebody interested in masculinity and interested in in how do we how do we kind of do leadership well? I just thought there was so much really profound stuff in there in the model that he presented, um, even without having that background in look, watching football and seeing that. So, yeah. I think there's also like something about honesty and being genuine. Like he felt like when he was interviewed, he wasn't like... He was very genuine in what he was doing. It didn't feel like he didn't feel like what he was saying to us, although it may well have been, was any different to what he was saying to his players. And so there was like this sort of felt like they're very ge- yeah, and really open as well. I was really surprised how open everybody was. So we got more from the players and the staff than you've ever got a World Cup before. So there wasn't this cynicism towards the press going, "Were well, they going to twist our words and portray us as these horrible human beings?" Mm. Yeah. But actually. They were just open with how they were feeling, what was going on, and I thought that was really refreshing. Yeah. What do you think? Is that like a is that media training? Do you think there was a strategy, or do you think that it was just Gareth? Probably both, and mm. isn't it? You've got you'll definitely have people employed to PR people will definitely be employed, but probably any good PR person would have looked at him and gone, "Oh, well, there's an opportunity to utilize like the natural." openness and I mean I saw this set of tweets from a guy who was a CBBC reporter for like children's for news round or something and he was saying how years ago when Gareth was the doing coaching for or whatever he was doing for you know a previous for one of the I think it was Hull or somewhere you know oh, it was Jake was, Humphrey wasn't he when he was at Middlesbrough yeah when he was at Middlesbrough that's it up north I feel ashamed that I said Hull when it's Middlesbrough <laughs> as a northerner but anyway so and he said that when normally as kind of children's reporters like they were just really not interested like for, when they go and interview people they'd be kept waiting nobody would and like can't have interviews cancelled and he said years ago um when he went to interview the Middlesbrough team Gareth Southgate like, came in like 10 minutes late apologized knew all the names of every member of staff on the um media team said let them spend the whole afternoon with the football players was really grateful for them coming so you know even that that was kind of an anecdote from somebody he'd known who'd kind of interacted with him years ago in the media so I think actually there is an authentic difference to how and he was getting them all to talk about how important football was for young people and for children and how it was important for them to see sport 
and so this real kind of just an authentic passion for the sport in a quite a pure way that's not just kind of cynical and about money or about you know kind of power in that sense and the FA are like giving him like a long contract right so isn't that right yeah I think he's there for a long time theoretically which is another interesting so someone's decided that's like that is the like trajectory that English football is going and they're going to invest in it rather than like going normally like you're sacked. So I wonder if that, like, psychologically, does a def- is a different thing as well. Like, oh, it's you not know about what? you failed this time, so yeah, you're out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's no, no pressure this year. And there's also there, like, a sense in which, you know, this is a long term thing anyway, so there's no, like, you're not mm-hmm. fighting for your job in the same way. So, because he was originally a footballer, is it normal that most of the people doing his job were previously footballers, or is he kind of, in, is that also quite it's pretty new? standard? So, cause I didn't, you know, I have literally no knowledge on these things. So it's normal that people have come through and been footballers and then become. Yeah, yeah. So, so it's not. So it's even just the whole kind of. Do you think it's because he was playing at a different time than the previous people? So I actually, know, it's just still very different. I think it's just very different. Mm. I think you're just seeing a a very different model of male leadership yeah. that I don't that I rarely experience from people. What even in the church. <laughs> Do you know what? He's pretty, <laughs> it's pastorally, it's what we should be seeing from our leaders in the church. And actually, rather than men trying to hide how they're feeling and what they're doing or emotional contact with people, mm-hmm. actually, I think it's a really good model for what Christian masculinity could look like in the church. Um, what would it look like? Do you think, how could it be replicated? Or is it just like, again, it's just that authenticity, right? Is that part of the deal? Well, do you think it's because he... So he talks about his him missing that goal in... What was it in? 96. There you go. Yeah. That, that actually, that learning that failing is not the defining... It, you, your life moves on. It's not the end of your life. You can learn from it. And, and that building of resilience. And I know we've spoken previously in the Think Tank, Tank about how currently, because there's this irony about how masculinity is framed as strength, which means that you're not allowed to fail, and actually the only way to really build strength is to fail and try again and, and keep trying and failing and getting back up again. And so is there something that, you know, he has kind of learned this lesson that actually I become stronger by admitting weakness and by failure being okay and that actually we need an entire revolution in masculinity that says it's okay to fail and not not make make it because then that allows for people to get back up again rather than not try yeah i think so i think it's interesting it was interesting listening to the players after the they won the penalty shootout against columbia whereas they they said the whole process had been you know what you're doing but don't be scared to, to fail. And if they'd been scared to fail, they probably wouldn't have won. Yeah. And so it was having confidence in the process, knowing they'd done all they could do um, mm. in the build-up, but, but not being scared to not being scared to fail. I think there's something in that, Natalie, around... Like, it's one thing for the society to learn that um, it would be OK to fail as a male and still be a leader that's what you're saying I think there's almost another layer that needs to be applied to church like leadership where you like because you know we've alluded to in the past uh, that church is not always on the curve (laughs) (laughs) a bit of an understatement there (laughs) yeah and so I don't think I can wait another 30 years for us to figure out that like authentic male leadership slash whatever and failure is okay you know this church just needs that now I mean I would say it's not even just about leadership it's about masculinity as a entire kind of identity you know rather yeah. than it just being about being a yeah. leader the entire way masculinity is constructed from the earliest days is about boys not crying about not boys not being weak about you know pull yourself together get up don't and you know there's the kind of British keep calm carry on attitude yeah. attached to that for, for those of us in the, yeah so you've got both of those things happening together and so from the you know from the earliest possible time these boys are being taught you know don't you, failure is not an option you can't risk failure so d- actually what the result of that is you don't try you don't you don't kind of take those risks and so ironically while you're 
while you're kind of saying that you're strong you've not actually gone through the process that would allow you to actually be strong um so but I think within leadership that um the issue do you think the issue is also not just about masculinity but is about how power is framed in the church and this idea that that so a church leader can't admit failure because that will kind of they the way they'll be they'll be judged as un, unable to be a leader like they should just give up if they admit failure so it's not that they stop failing they just don't <laughs> they just keep it all inside and so you've got to be competent you've got to be you know you look at the kind of people who are on the national christian platform and even somebody who might be saying oh you know um i'm working out of this weakness it's always in a place of victory over of that weakness it's not I'm currently struggling with this I did struggle with it and now I'm now I'm free now I'm and there isn't a space really for people to talk about their weakness in a place of weakness because then it's presumed they can't handle the the the, the world they can't handle their job so they shouldn't mm. be doing it so and I think that's an issue yeah and I wonder how privileged is in that too okay well it's okay for you to say that you're like You've come out of it because you're a white middle class man. Oh, it's always weakness. more complex yeah. if you're not a white middle class man. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Fundamentally. <No. laughs> but yeah, I suppose I think there's there's particular difficulties for women that are different to men. So I think if women cry, they're seen as overly emotional. If men cry, they're seen as failed as they haven't they're not being strong do you know what I mean but actually what how it works in practice is if a man cries we presume they're very sincere yeah. like um and all, yeah, so sort of <laughs> glamorizing yeah, yeah. yeah do you know my favorite word at the minute is by um the philosopher Kate Mann and she uses the word hympathy to describe this um this extreme support that we have for men when they when they cry yeah, or for men yeah. when they express weakness so you know when a man kills his wife but he was having debt problems ago it was really hard for him I was a loving father who just snapped and killed his children and we're always oh, not hard and so, you know that empathy of saying oh you know and like, I mean Donald Trump is a you know kind of a, a example of that this you know people saying standing up for him and, and saying oh you know poor him so I think, yeah, there is this sense, this idea that if men show weakness that they will be castigated and perhaps maybe in male-only circles that happens, but when you bring women in, often that leads women to go, oh, oh, he must be serious if he's crying. Because, you know, I always describe um, male tears a bit like unicorn blood, you know, like it's like so rare that when you see it, you think it must be a real thing. And so that allows then somebody who's abusive to cry and get away with being abusive because they cried and clearly they must be sincere because the only way men can cry is if they really really mean it so i think on the one side it is men it is frowned upon for men to cry or express weakness but on the other side when they do it often is they get a lot more cultural capital through that in a way that women don't where it's like she must be on a period she must be emotional she's clearly not capable of leadership like (laughs) she cries he brought up Donald Trump, so I'm able to like... Oh, I was just about to go there. <laughs> oh, we're all there. We're just moving there. <laughs> I was just thinking about the comparing and exactly, contrast on the yeah, leaders. Yeah, like, that is like two... So, and also, I was comparing and contrasting Trump and Southgate. Exactly like, yeah. where my head was. Which was like, which is an interesting thing. But also, I was holding in that... Um, thought the, that um, on Andrew Marr yesterday, uh, Andrew Marr was like, um, to Theresa May... Um, why? Basically, why did you let him hold your hand, <laughs> arm going down the stairs, and then, and the sort of like, I think Theresa May shot it back at Andrew Marr, like, but don't basically don't be ridiculous. The point was ended, but it's an interesting thing, isn't it? Like that. So Trump's appearing to be helpfully human, um, and what that means, and how the dynamics of that work out. And would Gareth Southgate do that? And if Gareth Southgate did that, would that be okay? Because it's Gareth Southgate. Or is there something like, are we questioning it differently because it's Trump, it's Trump as opposed to like Gareth Southgate? What's the whole dynamic? Yeah, I, I was, I was going to say that there's, you see that you know, Trump's often held up as a bastion of masculinity in certain circles, and how often that comes across as a very bullying... Mm. I have, even the, even him saying, oh, you know, Theresa, sue the EU, that's how you're going to get what you want to get. Don't negotiate, sue them. But <laughs> this whole idea that masculine leadership almost looks a bit like bullying. Mm. So there's a power dynamic where m- maybe as a, a man in leadership, you have all the answers. And so actually you can dictate down to people what they should do and what they should think, mm. which is the antithesis of 
there's a long word, it's hard to get out for a podcast, but that's the antithesis of what Southgate's trying to do, mm. which is get alongside people yeah. and almost lose the hierarchy. And that, you know, we said earlier, the pastoral side to leadership that Trump and definitely the, doesn't show. Yeah, and there's blame that Trump, it's interesting, like, you don't hear Jared Southgate going, well, it's because of all these other people who've done all this crap before, and it's been history of bad. We just, he doesn't even, like, reference the, like, part. He's just like, this is what's happening. Whereas, you know, even this morning, Donald Trump's tweet- tweeting out before his meeting with Russia is how all the other presidents have done a really crap job and it's a shocking situation because all everyone else's fault and I'm coming in with my, with my, sit- my sword and a shield and I'm going to, like, save the day and it's going to be... Me and my orange this, face. I'm sorting out this mess. Me and my orange face. Just like fixing. I think, yeah, that whole thing about him, that lack of ability to take responsibility, that actually um, is part, isn't that part of kind of how masculinity is constructed, that you can never be wrong. And so when you are wrong, you have to find a way to... Uh, to, to avoid taking responsibility and you know that's kind of how PR works right and how when we see failure in in the church how it often works particularly in you know kind of some of the big failures in the US we've seen like you know they hire these PR companies that say I'm sorry you feel that way you know rather than I'm sorry I hurt you and so I think there's this whole kind of um this this need to damage limit which well, damage limitation which is about avoiding responsibility but also the way masculinity is constructed is like I can't admit that it was my fault because that will make me wrong and I can't be wrong because as a man I'm supposed to know it all and have it all together and those two things together actually make somebody look really weak and they they don't actually nobody I suppose there are some people who swallow that and believe it all but actually for a lot of us we're looking at that and going well he just looks pathetic it doesn't actually manifest as strength for the people who are critically engaging with it does it no no I'm um I'm kind of like interested what the Christian comparisons are like, who are the Christian people, church leaders, who we, like, put there? And then I'm, like... And then I'm jumping also to thinking about, like, youth ministry and, and why, you know, I hear, like, often hear... I've heard recently, particularly, like, you know, who are the, like, next big leader? Who's the new Mike Pilibachi? Um Do we need any more? Well, that, well this is my... That <laughs> was exactly my question, is, like, I don't think we do have those people... But I don't think it's a problem. I think it's a good thing, in fact, um, that we're squashing some of that stuff because it just... Well, I don't think we're squashing it at all. I just think it's not happening. And that's just because people are like, well... Well, there's a, there's a decentralisation through social media, isn't there? That people people mm. can engage with other people's thoughts and ideas without them having to be given um, the legitimacy of a, a like a f- official platform. Like you don't have to be on a, on the sole survivor stage for people to think that you're worth listening to. You just start tweeting, and if people like what you say, there's an opportunity for them to listen to you, or you can, yeah. you know. So there's a decentralisation of that power and a uh, at concrete online. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so that is do you know what I mean there is that sense that it it it's just we just don't live in a world where it works you know kind of the biggest influences are often people who've got well known through being youtubers and particularly for the young people young people are not like oh yeah this I've been told by my church to listen to this or go to this it's more this is this is what's of interest to me, and they can curate their own experience of the world. They don't have to have somebody telling them, taking them somewhere for them to listen to a talk, do they? No. No, but I question if that's necessarily a wholly <laughs> positive, uh, a wholly positive thing. Rob Bell, loving all over the thing called the the undernet in three parts, and talked about how there's no, um, at least if someone has a, an official platform there's been some nu- a nuance to their thinking and some accountability yeah. in what they're saying whereas I can say anything I want in 280 characters and some people might love it and it might take off it's never going to because I'm going to be tweeting it but <laughs> there's then no accountability to what I've said yes um, you're right so that's how Jordan Peterson exists yeah. right <laughs> Um, for people who don't know who he is, just don't you don't need to know. But anybody who does know who he is, he's like that's how he's became really well known because he and he kind of misrepresents his own 
his own kind of qualifications. So he became famous because he said he'd refuse to obey Canadian law and use people's preferred pronouns and names and made out that he was going to be imprisoned for, you know, as a, like, political, you know, kind of dissident because he refused to, like, keep with this, you know, ideology that he disagrees with. But the fact was, like, there was no kind of prison sentence attached to it, you know, so it's like he has built this platform on an entire made up thing but is speaking into the concerns of like generally white men who are feeling that their, their power is being encroached on and that they're now having to be held accountable for some stuff and that's you know causing them anxiety and so here he comes to save them with his clever words that aren't actually very clever um and there's so many christians who like him i mean like yeah, I mean, he's definitely a study in masculinity because he's generally liked by Christian men. I don't know any Christian women. Well, actually, maybe I do know one who likes him. But, you know, generally it's Christian men going, oh, he's so clever, oh, he's saying what we all need to know, even though he doesn't actually believe in Jesus and thinks we're all kind of like lobsters. When, you know, kind of, surely we believe we're made in the image of God, not the image of lobsters, but apparently it doesn't matter. So. I like, I'm trying to work out as well whether then... So if we've got this, say, we haven't got this platform thing, or we do in part have that in church leaders, in church leaders, I guess. Um, like, what does the Gareth Southgate leadership look like for young people? I guess it's us, with Christians who work with young people, um, and what we do with the young people that we work with so, right, I guess going back to the authentic, authenticity bit that actually forget about your platform just do a good job yeah. with the young people who are in front of you forget mm. about all of that stuff forget about just do a good job with the young people in front of you which I'm increasingly convinced is the argument for a lot of <laughs> church problems yeah I think it's losing ego I don't see ego when I look at Gareth Southgate at the moment Yeah, it's losing the BS yeah. yeah too often it's all about us and I think it's again it's that pastoral model it's getting alongside young people getting down on, on our knees when they're on their knees in despair because something's happened and it's yeah. celebrating their successes when mm. good stuff's happened and being there do you think the unusual thing is that Gareth Southgate exists or is it unusual that he is in a position of authority and power? Because actually, I'm sure all of us can look back throughout our lives in church and outside of church and see both men and women who have operated in terms of pastorally and loving us and modelling a form of leadership that is profoundly different than, than the toxic stuff that we see and the stuff that's really unhealthy or very power-based. And actually, is it not that that's not unusual? The unusual thing is for somebody to be able to operate in that way at the level he's operating. Do you know what I mean? It's that. It's, yeah. I think it's a surprise to see him able to operate at the level he is. And I, what, would be an inter- what would have been an interesting thing is if England would have lost three group games, gone out of the World Cup, would the... Would the press, would we be sat here celebrating his model of leadership and his masculinity? No, well, if we'd just would be like, it didn't just, work, we need we have, Would we have just got on Twitter <laughs> and joined in with the angry, yeah. didn't he do a bad job? Maybe because he yeah. wasn't manly enough. Yeah, he but actually, it, has he succeeded because he wasn't? And does that is that why he's succeeding? Like, is it kind of actually... Succeeded because the... 11 men managed to kick a leather ball <laughs> into the back of a net. But they probably did that but did because they do of that the way because he got of his leadership? Like, like, was that the thing that made it successful? Though, actually, you look at some, you know, you look at some of the kind of most successful sports teams, not necessarily around football, but you look at maybe perhaps how, you know, like, say, Chinese gymnasts are led, and it is definitely not in a kind of, like, you know, but they're the best in the world. So there is a sense that there are, it does work to, there is a way that dominating and controlling can result in success, but but actually what at what cost to humanity is that? Do you know, so... And actually, it hasn't really been modelled on the world stage, this form of leadership, that we've all kind of been told that the only way to really succeed is to dominate control, to have power over and to shout people into doing what you want them to. And so maybe it's just that we haven't tried it, and so now it opens up a possibility of... I think it will. We didn't have the fourth best team in the World Cup. Our squad was not the fourth best squad (laughs) in the World Cup by a long shot. But that model of leadership got the got the best out of those players 
Yeah. Uh, probably more than the best out of those players. Do you think part of that was their age? Because they were quite inexperienced, weren't they, and a younger team. Do you think if you'd had an older team who were used to a much more kind of aggressive form of leadership that it would have... Is there this thing of, is it that is it for such a time as this? Do you know, like, that we are... Mo- I mean, I don't mean that, you know, that profoundly prophetically, but, you know, just <laughs> more generally, is it that, as a society, we've moved to a place where, for younger people, they're not going to respond to this... Stuff in the same I way. think there's just something about how millennials need leading. So that's, yeah. you had a team of millennials basically, and millennials tend not to respond if they're being shouted at. Yeah. Just why is that then, do you think? We're all millennials just about around the table, aren't we? Yeah. Do we. I, no, I don't respond well if I'm being barked at or criticised. Um, yeah. Is it because parenting changed so much? You know, like, we went from, like, an authoritarian, like, 1950s, do as I say, not as I do. Everybody was parenting that way to, like, this... When children's rights came in mm. as, like, a framework for society that children are human beings who... And how you are experience childhood is going to affect how you experience adulthood, that, that it became kind of the majority of millennials were parented in a much less authoritarian way and so we are not well, that's what that Bob, Bob Mayer refers to in Faith Generation what yeah. is friendship parenting like there's a, like a distinct change in how yeah. baby you can, you can be your parents best friend yeah or your which parents I'm, not, be your best I'm not friend. massively a fan I think I'm a bit more authoritarian yeah I don't want to be my <laughs> best friend I like I think I want to I want for my kids it's that thing of how do you keep maintain boundaries then yeah. you know as a as a parent if you don't have kind of a established power dynamic you know we should be the ones educating our children we should see that we have a responsibility but at the same time that that comes yeah it's, it is a different different way isn't it yeah. do you think that's why millennials is i think that's a big part of it isn't yeah it, have we also have we also not been told that our voice matters and actually yeah. you know we've been brought up saying that we have an opinion and that our opinion is important yeah. and our voice matters and so when we come up against an authoritarian leader yeah. and someone who's you know, very, I guess, very strict and very power hungry yeah. and above us, our natural response is to push back because actually yeah. we're told that what we have to say and what we do matters and is important. As millennials, yeah. yeah. What's the deal then with the Trump situation? How has, how has, how has he got about that? Was he voted in mainly by millennials? I know he's mainly voted in by evangelical, white evangelical Christians. Mostly. <laughs> white evangelical men. Uh, yeah. most, I um, think there was it, quite a lot of women, actually. Quite a lot of white evangelical women, I'm ashamed to say, were also... I think it changes when you're... I think it probably changes when you're looking at the spectrum, like an electorate. Yeah, right. and actually, like, evangelical kind of culture is, in terms of parenting is still kind of quite authoritarian as a particularly American if you think about like the fundamentalist type of you know homeschooling yeah. I wonder whether there isn't as much of a shift towards this kind of much more um yeah well f- for friendship parenting or kind of, yeah like giving children a voice but do you think that that us believing we have a voice is where there's this belief in millennials being entitled because we believe our voice matters and that's like seen as being entitled that we think that we should be heard that is that where that comes from it probably, it probably has a part of a role to play in that yeah. do you think we are entitled we all have a platform though going back to the previous yeah, argument yeah, right so we all like have the ability to be heard and to have that power voice. and it's just that I haven't got enough followers to have a crowd do you know what I mean so my voice is not as important my voice is valued by the fact I've got 500 as opposed to like time. I'm legitimised by the number of followers I have on Twitter. You've reduced them? I'm, no, I'm legitimised by it. Mine, had, mine didn't reduce when the bots all got kicked yeah. off. Like, they were all real. Yeah. You don't have any fake followers. I have no fake followers. <laughs> That's because I'm about five. <laughs> <laughs> like your mum. Yeah. I follow Mike. <laughs> I, I do, I follow you. I, I will follow you. I think, follow you. I, think <laughs> I do follow you. I suppose there's a difference between the perception of millennial entitlement versus whether that actually is entitlement and what, whether that comes with actual power to do anything. Because, mm. you know, the fact that you feel your voice should be heard doesn't necessarily mean it will affect change. For instance, if you look at Brexit, how, you know, and if you look at kind of who holds the majority of wealth and who holds the majority of decision-making power, it's not actually millennials in one sense. Um, although we're not really a homogenous group, are we? You know, there's... You know, class differences, yeah. um, race differences, gender differences, all of, you know, all of that stuff, disability, and how all that interacts to make millennials not 
homogenous, unsurprisingly. <laughs> I mean, also, I think it's interesting looking at Trump as a reaction to Obama as well. Like, you know, the Oba- I suppose Obama's leadership much more reflects the Gareth Southgate sort of stuff, doesn't it? In terms well, of he's like, yeah, he's that community organising, yeah. like all of that citizen stuff. Could yeah. be that is Obama's bag, isn't it? That is his. Yeah, and actually, how I guess kind of this re- the re- Trump as a response is something about people who want an authoritarian leader feeling threatened that Obama isn't. You know, like when he cried at that rally for around gun violence, and how that was portrayed as like we you can't have the leader of the free world crying yeah. and actually you know for me that that was a really profound moment of look this is a person who's a human and i would trust somebody who cries over children being shot like more than i would trust somebody who's like you know not crying when children are being shot but what does that mean about what level of humanity we want in leaders you know do we want them to be humans or do we want them to be like robots who make decisions on a cost benefit analysis rather than the human cost that you can't really balance out in the way that mm. you know because around militarism isn't it like oh what's going to be the least casualties we'll make decisions about you know the least casualties rather than how do we not have war yeah. <laughs> the challenges and the Obama thing is really interesting is the challenges is myself I guess for me as a male leader is what kind of model of leadership am I demonstrating advocating living out as I go about leadership so am I how often do I fall into the trap of going to the I guess the the common tower going to your head and being very authoritarian in leadership versus how often do I go to a, a more pastoral model of leadership where it's not me it's it's together rather than us and them and then what kind of what kind of men boys teenagers am I trying to disciple so when they hit the big bad world, what model of leadership are they going to be? A, response, responsive to, but then also what will they be modelling when they kind of hit that, hit that stage? I think, I think also, like, how do you equip them in a world that is not necessarily going to think that's a good idea? Do you know what I mean? Because it's one thing to say, right, this is how we want to be, this is how being a man is not just about being strong and not crying and having it all together but actually you're going to go into a world where a significant proportion of it's going to expect you to be like that and how do we equip them you know I think yeah I suppose for me going forward from here it's thinking about I guess not being a man um (laughs) it's not about how I'm how I do that but how do I raise my son and how do I how do I enable create conversations and spaces which allow men to start walking across that bridge yeah. to new ways of being and I think it's like the challenge is that for men who are already thinking about this there's an openness and a willingness to go there what about for the people who just have never thought about this before how do we open up this reality this possibility yeah. and make it a, a positive thing for those people so I suppose for me I'm thinking how do I you know I've got a 12 year old son what do I do to help him um, you know how do I yeah how do I kind of have a approach to masculinity within my work that enables people yeah yeah moves people forward and is honoring of where they're at and how do we move them forward because that's got to be different is differentiating between the person like yourself Mike who's like I need to move this forward and I need to you know kind of think about how I'm doing it and somebody who's just like in church we need men to be real men and we need to fight bears and then we'll get lots of men in the church at the end. You know, how do you yeah. kind of start that conversation, which is in a totally different place than somebody who's already having that conversation. So I think for me that's the challenge, is how do we how do we broaden this out so that it's not just people who are, you know, already speaking to the converted, you know, um, how do you make it available for other people who aren't there yet? What about you, James? Um... Yeah, I don't know. I'm sort of challenged on that. There's a couple of people I can think of who are have seen, who I are in my world that are in sort of significant places of leadership who are like struggling to be in the system that values Trump star leadership when they're actually Gareth Southgate star leaders. Mm-hmm. And so I feel like I might actually do something specific with 
with them around encouraging them. Um, Because I feel like actually that place is quite a lonely place and quite devalued if you're in a system, Mm. as a youth worker particularly, that once... Yeah. We were actually just like, why are you not at the front more? Why are you not like walking around with the chest out? Why are you wrestling bears? Yeah, yeah, but not yeah, but not even that extreme. I think sometimes like much su- more yeah. subtle than that. Um, yeah, why aren't you building your platform? Yeah, oh, and so what a, word, what a phrase. And so that um, is a hard place to be if you're a youth worker who's not doing that because you don't see the value of it. Even if your work is successful in inverted commas, um, in that it's growing. Mm-hmm. So there's what one I'm particularly thinking of who's like doing an amazing job in terms of numbers. So like it's been very successful, but it's just been battered because mm-hmm. they're not, yeah, leading leading with the level. And is there a tribute? Is there a lack of recognition that 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 particular way of being is why it's growing is it almost like it's growing it's almost growing would they see it as growing in spite of that person's kind of counter cultural approach and almost no, like it could be better if they did it differently or? I don't know no. I don't know and I'm sort of like left with, left with a bit of a challenge about how we in the youth ministry world how we appreciate those people and mm. like but also how we value that and say that's good yeah. What's interesting, bringing it back to Jesus. Thanks. Because we probably should. We should. Is that the model of leadership Jesus shows is the Southgate model. And, you know, it's pastoral, it's meeting people where they're at, it's not dictating and being authoritarian. It's. Well, yeah. he, uh, he's only ever really authoritating and dictating to the people who are in power like, yep. and to telling them how wrong they are. So, I mean, I think, you know, it's quite like a bit more of that too. <laughs> Good. Thank yes. you. Thank you. You have reached the end of the Concrete Podcast. Show notes will be on the website and you can find us on social media at Concrete Online.